So now we are moving on to the next session, highlight of the day, the state of art lectures. There are two lectures. To chair the session, we are inviting Professor VK Chawla, who is the one of the pillar of the hepatology community in India. So no need of any other introduction to Professor VK Chawla. And uh, Professor Pamecha, who is the head of the unit of the liver transplant surgery at ILBS. And uh, the chairperson, uh, you can please introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Joy. Thank you, Charles, for uh, uh, involving us in this program. We have a very eminent speaker now, Professor A.S. Soyen, who is very well known to the transplant community and the hepatologists. As you know that uh, he's the chairman of the transplant uh, program at Medanta. He's also a Padma Shri recipient. Uh, he's, uh, he's a well-known figure and he's in India as well as abroad. He started the live-related liver transplantation in India. And uh, with COVID having been there, he's, we see him off and on on the TV giving his expert comments on COVID. Can we have Dr. Soyan to talk to us on small for size syndrome? Avi. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Chavla, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, this is, of course, home turf. LTSI is, uh, is our own uh, organization. So feel very proud that uh, we have regular high quality academic activity going on. So thanks to the uh, new dynamic young team at the LTSI, at the helm of LTSI for organizing this. So I'm going to take you through, in the next few minutes, I'm going to take you through our experience of largely using low GRWR grafts with inflow modulation to avoid small for size syndrome. Small for size syndrome is a collection of clinical entities where the transplanted liver tends to not function very well after typically after a week or so of transplantation, somewhere between five and 10 days, and it can happen in many circumstances. So when I say managing small for size syndrome, I'm going to talk about largely uh, as to what it is, what leads to it, and how you prevent it. Because once it happens, then of course, there's a mad scramble for uh, changing antibiotics and putting stents into the biliary tract when they are not needed and doing plasma phoresis and even going to the extent of retransplantation. Of course, 70-80% uh, of the actual small for size syndrome uh, uh, problems actually settle down. So it's not really failure, but it's just dysfunction. But in 20-30% to of the cases, it results in graft loss. So really, you want to avoid it. And that's where the focus of today's talk will be. So it generally manifests day five to 10 as hyperbilirubinemia, coagulopathy, and ascites. Uh, eventually what happens is because of uh, relative ischemia to hepatocytes, uh, cholestasis, and poor Kupfer cell function, there is sepsis that supervenes in every case of established SFSS. And there is encephalopathy and, and graft failure. So whenever you are diagnosing uh, SFSS as a cause for early graft dysfunction in the post-operative period after liver transplantation, there is need to exclude early sepsis, any vascular or biliary complication, and of course, acute cellular rejection, because these are the things that happen early on after liver transplant. So the concept is that basically in SFSS, there is inadequate functional and well vascularized volume of the transplanted liver. And that is why there is a lack of uh, adequate function of the graft. And sometimes it picks up and sometimes it does not. It can happen with any liver transplantation, but it is most often seen in living donor liver transplantation in adults where the graft to recipient weight ratio is low. That means the graft is of low volume. 
even it can even happen as a secondary complication. You may have a graft that works perfectly normally for 10, 15 days. And after uh, there is partial necrosis because of a vascular issue or partial congestion because of an outflow problem, one of the outflow veins may get blocked. Or if there is sepsis related graft dysfunction, we even even seen it after COVID infection in a recipient. So any compromise to the graft and they can be secondary uh, you know, graft dysfunction, which is very similar to small facade syndrome. And basically, again, the logic is very simple. It happens because of loss of functional volume after initial good function with adequate GRWR. So there are several factors that affect the occurrence of SFSS, chief among which are uh, portal inflow, portal out, uh, venous outflow, the status of the recipient, whether they have high meld, sepsis, what their performance status is, the status of their portal circulation, whether they have too many shunts or too little shunts, and whether they have lots of portal hypertension, and what the hepatic arterial flow is like, and of course, the quality of the graft. So these are the various factors which go to determining whether a patient with a low, low, low graft volume will have SFSS or not. So what really happens is that eventually, whether there is high, whether you're a believer in high portal flow theory or a high portal pressure theory, eventually there is sheer stress on the endothelium. That's what happens. So the eventual effect of high flow stroke, high pressure is that there is sheer effect on the endothelium of the sinusoids. So there is sinusoidal congestion. There is hemorrhagic necrosis of the perisinusoidal hepatocytes. And with the sinusoidal congestion, what happens is there is a hepatic artery buffer response and the amount of hepatic arterial flow reduces. And there is relative ischemia. This obviously results in early graft dysfunction. And the hemorrhagic necrosis of the perisinusoidal hepatocytes also does the same. And as there is graft dysfunction, there is destruction of the hepatocytes, there is even more, uh, you know, even uh, a higher increase in, or a, uh, even a bit more increased portal pressure because obviously the portal pressure is high to start with. And when there is graft damage, the portal pressure rises further. And this is like a vicious circle, basically. At the molecular level, what happens is that there is, to start with, there is hyperdynamic flow, and there is endothelial cell damage, which results in adhesion molecule upregulation and cytokine release. And this results in macrophage uh, activation and infiltration, uh, increase in inflammation, inflammation, initiation of the apoptotic pathway. And in general, because of the increased inflammatory uh, uh, infiltrates, there could be enhanced alloantigen presentation and an exacerbated acute rejection. All this obviously results in loss of uh, hepatocytes. I don't know if you can see the bottom part. And that results in graft failure. So how to prevent it? You have to improve the quality and the quantity of the graft, it's obvious. So that means the general lower limit of GRWR is 0.8% of the body weight of the recipient. And in well-preserved recipients, they may tolerate even less, even up to 0.6 or 0.65 with or without portal inflow modulation. And you must, must ensure that the quality of the liver graft is good in terms of them not having more than 20% macrosteatosis in case of right lobes and 30% macrosteatosis in case of left lobe donors. Because obviously left lobe donors generally uh, tend to be for kids. And therefore, there is a little more leeway available here in terms of volume. They should not have state of hepatitis, hepatitis or fibrosis. And of course, their uh, enzyme should be normal. You have to choose your recipients well. You have to optimize the recipient status. And that's something you can do in living donor liver transplantation. And uh, you have to make sure that the low GRWR livers go to stable recipients. And if you have sick recipients, they are not good candidates for 
low GRWR livers. Otherwise, they're going to get into trouble with SFSS. So their GRWR should be 0.8 to 1 or even more, and they should have minimal steatosis if you're transplanting sick patients. The other way to ensure uh, that SFSS doesn't happen is to have a good hepatic portal venous outflow and partial grafts. Left lobe, as you know, has both the middle vein and the left vein, and the right lobe um, obviously has the right vein. But the anterior sector venous outflow and the inferior venous outflow must also be uh, reconstructed. But these are examples of how one does that. I mean, everybody present here presumably has done it or knows about this, how to reconstruct anterior sector outflow. Uh, these are methods using uh, autogenous veins which we used earlier on in our experience. Now we use PTFE grafts. We've published uh, that then, and our PTFE graft technique has been published in a couple of papers in the last two years. Uh, this is one example of the PTFE graft reconstruction. Um, here we've used a, a, <clears throat> a venous conduit between a very thin walled segment eight vein and the PTFE graft. And this is the new MHV draining the segment five and the segment eight. This is uh, another example of the inferior veins, three of them being reconstructed onto a boat graft. So we drain them on one side of the graft and on the other side, we make a hole here and join this to the cava. Now the main issue of portal inflow. Now. The idea is to prevent portal hyperperfusion, and we believe that a portal of portal pressure of 18 or less is, is a good one to aim for. But certainly, if the volume of the graft is low, less than 0.7%, then you should look for less than 16 millimeters of mercury. You should keep the portal flow between ideally between 100 and 300 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute. And there are several methods of um, modulating the portal inflow, uh, which we are again all familiar with. One is splenic artery ligation. The other is hemiportal cable shunt. And the third, of course, is that I haven't mentioned here, but of course people do splenectomy, which is uh, also approximately the same thing as splenic artery ligation, but possibly there, there are a lot of people who believe that splenectomy works better than this. And post-operatively, if you're stuck with what you think is FSSS, you can, you can try splenic artery embolization or somatostatin, but it only works some of the time. That's because much of the damage to the graft has already happened post-operatively. It starts to happen as soon as uh, within an hour or two after you reperfuse the liver. So we published this paper where we talked about our experience with low GRWR grafts. And we gave our policy of portal inflow modulation. And the answer to this question that this paper addresses is portal inflow modulation always necessary for successful utilization of small volume live donor liver grafts? The answer is no, it's not always necessary. So let's uh, show you our protocol. But basically for GRWR more than 0.8%, there is no portal uh, inflow modulation needed in our view. Uh, from 0.6 to 0.8, yes you have to select your patients for inflow modulation, especially when the portal pressure is high and the patient is sick and the meld is high. And the idea is to achieve a pressure of 16 or less. So this is the protocol that we use that we've described in this paper. If the portal pressure during dissection phase is more than 15, then uh, you need to follow this protocol. And if it is less than 15, obviously there is no question of needing a portal inflow modulation. So if the GRWR is borderline low volume, that means between 0.75 and 0.79, then you simply get away with a splenic artery ligation. If it's between 0.7 and 0.74 and the portal pressure is more than 18, then you would probably need a shunt a hemi cable shunt. And if the pressure is borderline high between 16 and 18, then you give a, then you do a splenic artery ligation. 
and if GRW are less than 0.7 and the pressure is high, then you need a hemiporo cable shunt. Oftentimes, we find that even though the GRWR is low, the pressures are not very high, and that's because of multiple shunts that exist in patients, in many patients. So if there are significant photosystemic shunts which are pre-existing at the time of surgery in recipients, then they may not need a portal inflow modulation despite having a low GRWR. This is a typical um, uh, hemiporo cable shunt. Mm, you can see that uh, a new MH3 has been constructed using a PTFE graft. And this is the uh, uh, this is the conduit that goes between the uh, portal vein and the cava, giving us the hemiporal cable shunt. You can see that this portal vein is far uh, bigger in caliber compared to the conduit. So what we do is we will typically put a one to two centimeter long conduit, which is eight to 10 millimeter wide, ideally half to two thirds of the main portal vein diameter and the shunt flow should be in the region of one third of the total main portal vein flow. And that's determined on intraoperative ultrasound Doppler. And if there is a difference there, then obviously we will uh, accordingly adjust the diameter and the flow of the shunt. We found that over the years, we've been utilizing more and more low GRWR graphs, as you can see with uh, no compromise in the, uh, in the success rate. That means the one-year survival has continued to be between the around the 90% mark, uh, despite the increase in the use of low GRWR graphs from 10 to now 25%. There are some other options for patients who are large and who have small donors, and they are dual lobe living donor liver transplant and volume swap. Let me first talk about volume swap here. Um, so volume swap simply means that if there is no mismatch between the donor and the recipient in, the, in, in terms of the blood group, so it's a, let's say, an O donor to a B patient, but the amount of liver that the donor is being able to donate through their right lobe is let's say GRWR 0.55. So you look for another pair which has a blood group problem where the, where the recipient is, let's say, um, A and the donor is B. So that pair, the B can donate to this recipient and the O donor from this recipient can donate to the A recipient on the other side. So it's a swap between two families, one of which has a blood group problem and the other has a volume problem. Now, a word about dual lobe living donor liver transplantation. Uh, skip that. So these are the advantages and uh, challenges in dual lobe living donor liver transplant. Advantages are, of course, there's good GRWR for recipient and remnants for the donor. Uh, we can accept up to 30% steatosis for left lobe donors, normally obviously rejected for right lobe, right lobe donation. And the challenges are, of course, availability of two donors, anatomical, technical, logistic, etc. And, of course, potential risk to two donors. That's the main challenge or main downside. You know that uh, the Asan Medical Center specifically and Korean centers in general have uh, actually uh, taken this procedure uh, to becoming routine, really, because the, I believe the Asan Medical Center guys have done nearly 600 uh, dual lobe living donor liver transplants. So they would much rather do that rather than do uh, low GRWR transplantation. These are the various types of combinations of left and right lobes uh, that can happen. Uh, now, what we've done is initially our, this is just a interoperative picture of a dual loop graph we've done. And this is uh, a few months later. It's looking very good, it's looking like a normal liver. You, it's actually obviously a right lobe and a left lobe, but here you can see 
the three R flow veins of the two graphs put together. Um, so what we have done is a word about the technique. I uh, wanted to put a video, but then I thought uh, it'll become very long. So uh, what we do now is something called sequential perfusion. Initially, we used to do our dual lobes by implanting both of them and then uh, releasing clamps and perfusing them simultaneously, uh, as I had seen in Korea many years ago. But now we do sequential perfusion, which means we first put in the right lobe graft uh, and then we perfuse it and then we put in the left lobe graft. And obviously, if the KY is open, then we do a side clamp on a left and middle uh, vein stump, which is left long. And then we put in the left lobe graft uh, by separately clamping the left portal vein, the recipient left portal vein, and a side clamp on the left and middle of the recipient. So we are able to put the left lobe in like that. So that makes it very simple. It's really basically doing a right lobe graft like normal, and then doing a left lobe graft, and then of course, doing both the arteries and the ducts. So it makes it quite simple. We've done our last six or seven like that. So this is an outcome uh, table for our 14 dual lobe uh, living donor liver transplants out of uh, around 3,127 cases uh, as of uh, middle of 2020, I think. Uh, so there were 12 right and left and two left left lobes. And we used a lot of lobes with steatosis. Um, in the left left, there, in the left left combination, there were no steatosis, and in the right left combination, six of the twelve left lobes and one right right, right lobe uh, was steatotic. This is the uh, table showing the complications and the postoperative course. Um, so we eventually have two and seven, nine of these patients surviving, and we lost three of them early and two of them late. And in the last nine, we've had uh, uh, quite good success rate. We had only one early mortality and we had one late mortality and that was due to cancer actually. So I'd like to conclude here saying that small for size syndrome represents inadequate functional volume of a transplanted liver. It's much more likely to happen in low volume LDLT grafts in adults. Uh, so ensuring good quality graft, good graft volume, um, good recipient status or optimized recipient status and good graft outflow, that's venous outflow, and modulating portal inflow in selected cases to avoid portal hyperperfusion are the strategies to avoid it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soyen, for a wonderful talk, making things very clear. Uh, can I have the questions from the audience? Yes, there are two of them. Uh, Harshal Rajekar has said that there is a poor outcome in SFSS, the degree of liver dysfunction or the degree of portal hypertension. What is the outcome uh, as a result of? liver dysfunction or the degree of portal hypertension? So the uh, poor outcome in SFSS is clearly due to liver dysfunction. There is no doubt about that. Whether the liver dysfunction happened due to initial portal, portal uh, hyperperfusion, that's the question. And I believe that is the, that is the case, that yes, initially uh, SFSS starts off with portal hyperperfusion being the problem, shear stress on the, on the endothelial, uh, on the endothelium or the sinusoidal endothelium. But eventually what happens is there is liver dysfunction. In fact, you diagnose SFSS when there is liver dysfunction. And that liver dysfunction slowly ends in graft failure in 20 to 30% of the cases. That's what I said earlier. Yeah, but there's a question by Dr. Jayanti Venkatraman. Are all these modalities for SFS decided before surgery or peroperatively? So that's a, that's a good question. 
the answer to that is that majority of the times we decide before the operation what we're going to do. But when we are caught out, either by, uh, let's say, happily caught out that there are, despite the low volume graph, that there is there are a lot of shunts which pre-exist in the patient, which is why the actual portal flow is not very, very much. Then we don't need to do a hemiportocaval shunt, even in a low volume graft. So you could be happily surprised, or you could be you could be shocked when you realize that the graft that you thought was going to be 0.8% is only 0.62% because the CT scan overestimated the size of the right lobe. And in that case, you will have to see intraoperatively what the pressures are and whether you need to do a uh, splenic artery ligation or a shunt. So majority of the times preoperative plan, but sometimes the plan has to change during surgery as it often does in many other circumstances. Avi, when you're looking at the collaterals and uh, this is dependent on that, uh, don't you have the roadmap before the surgery or uh, do you identify the large collaterals at the time of surgery? So, uh, Yes, we actually have a good portal venogram in every recipient. There is no doubt about that. But what happens is that collectively, if the shunting is going to be significant enough to lower the portal pressure as measured intraoperatively, it's difficult to say just on images. But yeah, if you see a large three centimeter, uh, you know, portosystemic shunt, it's more than likely that the pressures will be low. But if you see multiple small shunts, you don't know where it actually leads you in terms of portal hemodynamics from before. Okay. Dr. Uh, Sain, uh, yeah, Dr. Pamecha. Hi. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, just about the shunt, just to continue the discussion on the shunt. So, you know, lots of center actually will ligate all the shunts. And uh, especially the Koreans, actually, they, they will go to the extent of doing interoperative, uh, you know, uh, photogram and then visualize all the shunt and ligate them. And uh, so I just want to know what's your policy about shunt ligation and uh, how far you go to ligate shunt? Do you believe in that or you don't believe in those things? So not in the context of a small fasci syndrome or a low GRWR graft, but if we find that the portal flow is low, then we have occasionally ligated shunts, but we are, we are not a great shunt ligating team as such. You know, I mean, we would do it like a couple of times a year, but we don't do it as often as the Koreans. But I know they, they, they obsess over it because they think that uh, for regeneration, it was, it's important to have good, healthy yeah. portal inflow. Yeah. So, uh, but we, we stick to the dictum that we like good inflow between 100 and 300. You know, the old rule that uh, that was published more than two decades ago. And uh, we, if we find that the flow is low, then we go after it. Okay. So you go by the flow that to decide whether to ligate a shunt or not. Absolutely. And if they Absolutely. are larger than, larger than a centimeter in size, or yes. you don't take yes. size in consideration about that. We okay. don't take size into consideration at all if the portal flow that we find and the portal pressure and the flow that we find is good, then we would not like it. Okay, so just continuing shifting from shunt to pressure, flow to pressure, mm. and uh, this is always a controversial issue about what to do, whether it is pressure or whether it is a flow, and uh, one of the things uh, which uh, we also be, we believe in is a gradient actually which is basically cable pressure will, uh, minus the portal vein pressure measured directly. And I noticed that you, you believe in measuring the pressure during the dissection phase where the serotic liver is still in and uh, gradient is, will be measuring after the implantation, which will actually give a you know, better idea about how much exactly the pressure is. And uh, so do you think, uh, the, me, what, what's your comment on that? So, so, you know, uh, Vinindra, I, I, I kind of see where you're coming from. What you're saying is it's impossible to gauge beforehand whether your pressure of dissection pressure of 30 will lead to a post-implantation pressure of 16 or 17 or 15, right? That's what you're saying. It's much easier to actually measure the pressure once you've implanted the liver and then decide what it is and then act on it. But it's kind of late to do the shunt at that point. I mean, you can do it. 
but so i think that by experience we have learned that if the uh, the graft is of low volume and the pressure is well into the 20s 24 26 28 we would just go ahead and make the shunt but if it is like 18 19 20 borderline then we would not make the shunt and then if the pressure is high after implantation then we would do a spinning artery ligation so that's where we are yeah avi there are a couple of more questions interesting ones ashish george asks you any experience of using portal vein banding in lieu of hpcs for portal flow modulation no we haven't got that experience okay dr sudesh sharda sir any experience of portal hypotension because of large shunt and sfs um right so he wants me to link up sfss to portal hypotension the portal hypotension on its own quest you know as a question i have uh, vinendra and i were just discussing that if there is less portal flow then i would like it the shunts and uh what has happened once to us is that we have had to ligate the hpcs that we created because we think that there was a steal happening so post operatively the patient did okay in the first 10 days or so and then then the patient lfts went off and then the doppler showed hardly any portal flow into the liver so we went ahead and asked dr bejal our interventional radiologist uh, uh, to go ahead and just just uh, uh block the shunt so we had to do that the the you know the artificially created shunt but in terms of the pre existing shunts we go after them if the portal flow to portal flow is low uh, intraoperatively okay sandeep satsangi has asked almost a similar question any instance where the portal pressure was normal intraoperatively due to the presence of shunts not mandating inflow modulation but in the post operative period the shunt got blocked and portal flow increased leading to sfss uh, phenotype not that i can remember no okay ashish george again long term issues with the hpcs that is how many have required closure post operatively so we've closed 3 we've closed 3 and two of them were for steel and one i think that the yeah the reason for closure of the third one was simply that we had re explored for another reason and the regeneration had happened so we thought you know this the shunt is not needed so we just close it you know okay and the last question dr hirak pahari excellent talk what is the limit of acceptance of low grwr grafts in terms of steatosis so steatosis we don't accept any steatotic graft which is less than uh, 0.75 ideally or even 0.8 uh, all the low grwr grafts strictly have to be uh, after subtracting the uh, the fat and that they shouldn't be fatty more than 10% so so for example if there was a 0.85 graft which was 20% fatty we would reject it but a 0.8 with a 10% fat we would accept it so low grwr grafts which are more than 10% steatotic we would not accept lastly avi just a point for my own clarification why are patients with high meld more prone to develop sfss they have more metabolic requirements so they they uh, so we all believe that they need a higher functional volume of the liver okay okay and what's the general prevalence in ddlt uh, uh, sfss ddlt sfss i don't know of the uh, literature on sfss in ddlt it's it's scarce if anything it's, because it's, it's been reported otherwise yeah, yeah yeah but i mean i think that no no it's been reported but i don't know the yeah. percentage there's no accepted uh, okay. percentage because it's not very common like i said okay. you know if there's any compromise on the graft uh, volume functional volume whether it is to start with or it happens in the first week or two after surgery 
you can have a functional or an if you know uh, uh, or a sim- syndrome or a dysfunction which is similar to sfss right okay thank you very much avi for an excellent talk and uh, uh, it generated a lot of questions and you answered them very well thank you very much thank you thanks Over a lot to dr pamecha